Hey guys, how you doing? JP Saricolia here, and welcome again to another podcast. This episode of, of course, the, this week's episode of Age of Heroes, and today is a special day for me, very special day, because I have a guest, a good friend, uh, Ed Bradley, who is a terrific artist, a uh, painter that has worked with many companies. Uh, he has done a lot of commercial products, but also a lot of uh, custom products. He is well known in the industry. He has worked with the best. And uh, I do admire his work, and I'm excited. For the last two years I've been doing this podcast, I've been actually dreaming to have a, an opportunity to have guests in this podcast. And one of the persons I was thinking the other day was Ed. And for some reason, it came to mind. And I said, I'm going to call him one of these days and let him know, ask him if he wants to be part of the podcast, if he wants to be on the podcast. But I just didn't do it. And he called me last week. Actually, he sent me a message. And that was, I think that was Godsend. And he said, do you need any help with the podcast? And I said, sure, let's do it. So I'm excited for that. Um, uh, funny note before we get into the conversation and uh, we're going to go on detail. We're going to let him speak his mind and to share what he has to say, uh, to say today. But one thing that I want to share here before we get into that, something that really speaks volumes for me of Ed a few years ago, there was a piece of, uh, there was some type of, uh, I don't remember, it was a statue that he did the prototype. He painted the prototype. I, I didn't know who did it. And as all collectors, I went on social media and I didn't like it. I didn't like the paint job. And I did, I, I think I said something. It wasn't really mean, but at the, I think it came across as a bit mean, like I was putting down his work. And I do remember that Ed uh, came into the conversation. I think if, if it was me, if somebody's talking smack about my work, I would say something mean back. But he didn't do it that way. He just was very polite about it. He told me that in reality, he was doing his work for hire. He is required to do certain things, and he did what he was asked to do. And that was the expectation, and that was his work. And to me, that moment was very special in the sense that... Um, he didn't just confront me for, you know, really, you know, saying whatever came to mind from my perspective. He said it from his perspective, but he was very professional, very kind about it. And from that moment on, and I, I always have great respect for Ed. You know, I think he's a fantastic guy. Not only he's a great painter, he, he does his work. Uh, he's knowledgeable about the hobby and the industry, but also I think he's a good guy and he's a, a person that I respect. So I just wanted to share that. Now it's on pretty much on YouTube forever, on the podcast forever. But I want to say, Ed, uh, that moment for me was very important because I still remember it. Um, yeah. And the way you approached the situation was, uh, you know, very different from other artists. You know, it's easier to hold a grudge to someone, but I think you didn't. You just took it as it was and you just let me know this is how it is. You know, I, I do my job and what I'm required to do, what is the expectation. And I just did what I was supposed to do. So it is what it is. And I think from that moment on, I felt more comfortable with you and your work. And I, I really pay more attention to your whatever you do nowadays. Uh, but what about you? I, I just, would you like to introduce yourself for those who don't not know Ed Bradley? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I'm just a, just a nerd that uh, got lucky. Um, I started doing models uh, somewhere towards the end of high school, uh, just okay. for fun. And then I stopped. I went into the military, mm -hmm. did that, you know, did that whole thing. Uh, I came home and noticed that uh, action figures and toys had kind of uh, made a little bit of a, an improvement, especially mm -hmm. with, with Todd McFarlane coming in uh, yeah. with the Spawn toys. He, he really changed everything. And then, you know, Toy Biz, they upped their game. And then they, uh, they, they offered some plastic models that weren't, weren't terrible. Um, but they were tapping guys like, you know, the Shiflet brothers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Sandy Calera, um, great sculptors, great designers. Um, you know, it, it kind of made me realize, like, okay, there might be, there might be something to this. Like I was into 2D art very mm -hmm. heavily. I, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back then you had a cartoon with a matching uh, action figure line uh, for everything. So, you know, you had Thundercats, Silverhawks, and Humanoids, mm -hmm. uh, in the Insectars or something like that, Rock Lords, Transformers, G.I. Joe, on and on and on. And I, I was obsessed with that stuff. There was just something about it. I would use uh, um, cardboard and hot glue 
and mm. duct tape and like the little poster tack stuff. I would use that as like clay to sculpt helmets and, and backpacks and armor on the figure. So even back then, I didn't know really where, where that was all headed. It's just kind of funny that looking forward that I ended up doing what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's always been a direct connection between me and, and three-dimensional uh, characters. So, but, but it all just started with cartoons and comics like everybody else. Good, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so then, you know, it started out as a hobby and then uh, the internet came along and opened up every, I mean, every door that you can think of. You, you basically just had to put in the, the effort. All you, I mean, it's, it's kind of like walking down the street mm-hmm. and you don't, make, you don't make any eye contact, you don't shake anybody's hand, you don't make any introductions and you wonder why you don't have any friends. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as soon as the internet became more accessible and we had, you know, better laptops and then we had smartphones and tablets, um, there's no reason why if you want to do anything for a living, if you find your market and you do a decent job of what you're trying to do, you can reach, you can reach all of the, the potential clients that you're trying to get. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and advertising is free. Yeah. You know, Instagram is free. Twitter is free. Facebook is free. That's all free advertisement in my mind and it's also a way to say okay i know all these names you know all these sculptors and and painters and people who um produce all this product and they're all on social media so to say that you can't get an audience with them excuse me is totally incorrect all you have to do is message them send them a, a direct message yeah and you can even attach your portfolio and boom there it is you don't have to travel anywhere you don't have to go to a show you don't have to try to get get them, you know, can can I get five minutes, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) when they're trying to do their social thing at their booth or on the floor or whatever. Um, It's totally different now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, the whole thing has changed a hundred percent, even to the point where now collectors have, have gone beyond the realm of, um, you know, simply being a consumer and now they're able to hire and create their own. You know, we've got the customs line now. We've got people who, decide well if you're not gonna if the companies aren't gonna do a bishop that i like or an ice man that i like or a rogue that i like then i'll just do my own mm-hmm. and here you are you know and it sells so yeah there, there's there's definitely a lot going on behind the scenes on both sides commercially and privately mm-hmm. um and i think there's a there's a lack of communication and a definite uh uh, there's some information, some knowledge that's missing because people either don't want to talk about it or they've been told not to, as you Correct. you mentioned. So yeah, yeah. I remember when um, I remember when I, I when I started collecting, um, and I've been a collector for pretty much almost 20 years. Um, but I do remember that I didn't didn't really get into customs or anything like that at the beginning because there was always this kind of gray area, it, something in the back room that everyone was talking about, but nobody really kind of shared the information. So it took me a while. I think it took me at least 10 years to really get into it. Uh, the first time that I, I was involved into some type of custom piece and uh, I didn't know anything. It was just a matter of asking the right people. So thankfully social media has allowed us to communicate with people. So I have to contact a friend, a friend from the forum or from Facebook group and says, Hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? And they kind of guide you through the process. But now of course we see a lot of custom stuff, but um, in the beginning it was just like a hush hush situation. Nobody really said anything. Although yeah. this hobby, and as we were talking the other day, it started pretty much in the, in the garage kits. Uh, right. and everything kind of took part of that. So I know that you were involved into garage kits, how that started. Yeah, I'm, I'm still involved. I still have a lot of friends and I still have contacts, uh, within the garage kit hobby. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Basically that's, um, it's the same thing as what we call customs or fan art now. Correct. Um, it's, it's unlicensed stuff. It's a sculptor, either a sculptor decides, Hey, I want to, I want to make, um, you know, I want to make a Dick Tracy or I want to make a, a Batman mm-hmm. or, a, or whatever character, but I'm not going through the trouble of paying a license or even getting permission and being told how to pose him, which costume to use, etc. They just, they're like, I'm only going to do like 20 to, to 30 of these things, you know? Yeah. Not a ton. Um, they're doing all the sculpting themselves. They're doing the, usually doing the molding and casting themselves in their garage or in their basement. Hence the name garage kid. The quality started out not very good. Um, 
they weren't doing pressure casting. All the parts were just straight cuts. Like, you know, it was all done in, in polymer clay. So they would bake it and take a jeweler saw and just chop it, you know, mm -hmm. at the bicep or at the thigh or at the neck. So builders had to really have some skill to clean up these terrible castings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and then re-sculpt all of the areas where the seams are, uh, which we don't have that now. Now the sculptors are, you know, they hide the seams pretty well. They'll do it where the, where the boot stops or, um, you know, where the hair comes out of the top of the, mm -hmm. the costume or, or whatever. They'll, they'll hide the seams. So a lot of times you don't have to do any putty work. You don't have to, you can paint everything separately. And then they'll put magnets, which we didn't do back then. Um, and it links it all together and boom, you put your statue on display. No problem. And if you need to tear it back down to move or redo your, your collection or whatever, there's no, uh, well, this is all glued, so I can't undo it all. Nah, it's magnets. You just take it all apart. Mm -hmm. It all has a, cust a custom box with foam in it for all the, mm -hmm. you know. You've even got um, optional parts now, which we didn't used to have. Um, and people are coming up with really cool little ways to uh, either store or display their optional parts, which I think is great. Uh, you know, make, making the most use of, of all the stuff you paid for. It's an investment. It's, right. it's, an, it's an investment on both sides, and that's the part that... Um, a lot of collectors don't talk about and the artists don't talk about. Um, the artists usually don't talk about it because we get viewed as being crybabies or mm -hmm. what are you complaining for? Like, you love this stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love it, but I don't want to do it for free. It's my, you know, if I'm investing a lot of my time and there's a lot of labor involved as well. Uh -huh. um, you do want to, everybody wants to be compensated, especially if they have a, a, a special skill Correct. that not everybody has. So if I'm a mold maker, um, I'd like to be paid paid well for my time and my and most importantly my knowledge. Correct. Like what what makes my molds better than somebody else's? Why are my castings better than the, the stuff that you normally buy? Well, because I I I took the time to learn how to do it the right way, and I don't cut corners, and I'm not cheap with my materials, you know. Mm. Um, so they, it's more than just what's on the surface when you look at a price tag. Uh, not so much on the commercial stuff. That's that's a whole other issue. But in the garage kit world and in the customs world, um, you have to justify your prices for everything. Now, I will say, and some people aren't going to like this, but I think the some of the custom stuff, the prices on just the kits are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, $800 to $1,000 mm -hmm. for, uh, for a box of plastic parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, get, get out of here. I'm sorry. Especially with, you know, some of the early stuff, these sculptors they were hiring, in my opinion, they weren't they weren't any good correct uh, a lot of the early customs pieces you know faces and expressions were terrible anatomy's not right the costumes look kind of trashy the bases were just rehashes of stuff we've already seen a million times mm -hmm. um and it's the same characters it's another wolverine another captain America. <laughs> like if you're gonna do them again and charge me eight hundred dollars for an unpainted version that sculpture better kick ass it better hold up correct and they didn't. And then not only that, but now you've got a collector who just spent that much money on parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and now he's got to go find a painter who's not going to charge him an arm and a leg, mm -hmm. to polish this turd and make it look like the other <laughs> stuff on his shelf. Like so now you're kind of setting the painters up for a, a job that they're not really ready for. So then, you know, we look at this stuff and we're like, oh, that's ugly. And they're like, okay, so how much? And you're like, uh, you know, two or three weeks of my time, what's that worth? Like I ask people, when well, you think my prices are high, how much money do you need to make in a week at your job? Why is, why am I any different? Correct. And nine times out of 10, when I say that to collectors, they go, Oh, well, I never thought of that before. How did you not think of that? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there, now there's, there's a difference. There's some painters who are hobbyists that have full-time jobs Correct. or they have a source of income and they paint on the side and that's fine. Um, if you want to haggle prices, those are the guys to haggle prices with. Um, one of the fastest ways to get me to stop responding or to not talk to you is to haggle my price or try to knock my, my price down because we both know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. If I agree to that lower price, somewhere in the middle towards the end of your project, when I start showing pictures of progress, you're going to say, oh, well, this looks too plain or this needs more of this or can you add that? So you're asking me for more. Mm -hmm. But you didn't want to pay more. Mm -hmm. So when I tell them you're going to get what you pay for, they feel like I'm shortchanging them or that I just, 
I didn't do my job. Well, that's that's not what it looks like when you do it for sideshow. Well, you're not paying <laughs> you're not paying sideshow money, so you don't get sideshow paint jobs. That's right. And then and that's not a good. I mean, I don't like that conversation. It's uncomfortable for me. But it's but, business. Uh, that's how it has to works. be. Yeah. Yep, it has to be. So you know, regarding the custom stuff um, and the garage kit stuff, that's that's what that is. It's um, it's it's absolutely buyer beware. Um, you get what you get. Don't have a fit. Correct. And, I think yep. you I think you touch on that uh, important uh, subject, and I think a lot of people forget that that like you said, it, you get what you pay for. Uh, if you pay little, then you get little. If you pay more, uh, then you get more. And you know, I think that's the difference because right now nowadays a lot of companies, you know, I, I seen that even from collectors from uh, licensed products is that they say, why is it why is it that everything is so expensive nowadays? And of course, you know, the cost is going up, and there are a lot of factors. But at the same time, it's amazing to see. How these products are coming out in comparison to how they were before all the stuff that the companies are doing all the additions all the extra parts all of that that just adds to the price tag in the end because you know you see it from the perspective as a painter uh as a you know uh, individual painter but i have to see it also from the perspective where big companies they have this have tons of painters to do all these products and they had to pay them as well and people want a lot of detail people complain about the little things so yeah, sometimes you have to think, uh, you have to put things in perspective. I feel that that's something that is missing most of the time in the conversation. Like people, they, yeah. they speak a lot for, for little, you know, for, for less of what they're paying. So sure. um, it is what it is, I think. Well, and as consumers, I'm a consumer. I mean, I'm, I'm a father. Correct. I'm a, homo I'm a homeowner. I'm a husband. And I'm a business owner. And I'm also a fan. You know, um, there's, stuff I there's stuff I want for me, too. So, the, yeah. The, the the prices definitely scare me off. They do. Um, <laughs> but you also have to look at, you know, as a company, okay, if I want to do Spider-Man and then I, I, I'm i putting out, or Marvel in general, Dis I got to talk to Disney. I have to pay for a license. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I got to make sure that I'm keeping them happy. And at the same time, I'm keeping my employees happy. And ultimately, I'm keeping my customers happy. That's a lot of work Correct. considering – what the customers want is probably not going to line up with what the license holder will approve. Mm -hmm. So now I'm trying to do my best version of Spider-Man and the collectors are saying, Hey, you know, say sideshow, for instance, Hey sideshow, why do you keep doing this? Or Hey sideshow, why is he posed like this? Or Hey sideshow, why did you make the eyes this version and not that version? And mm -hmm. the answer is because they answer to, a license holder. They answer to a representative from Disney slash Marvel who has to approve the design, has mm -hmm. to approve the sculpt, has to approve the paint, has to approve the packaging. And now they've got to deal with, okay, now what's the price point on this thing? After they've done all their, their, Homework. Uh, yeah. What, how, what's the price on this so that I can make it worth it to, you know, pay my license and my royalties and then pay, my my designer, my sculptor, my painters, my factory, you know, material for all the packaging, uh, all the distribution, the holding things in the warehouse, keeping up with my website so that all my orders are, are are straight, and then also the back and forth with all of the collectors who may have problems or complaints or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so when a when a com when a collector comes in day one when that pre order that picture pops up on the internet. And they just immediately garbage, easy pass, trash, yeah. you know, on a, on a new Wolverine. And it's like, well, first of all, how many Wolverines do you need? And second of all, you know, this is the best that they can really do with what they're allowed to do. Because when you say, hey, Sideshow, why don't you? The answer is because they probably weren't allowed or it never got approved. Correct. You know, there, there's products that you guys, you know, there's stuff I've done that'll never see the light of day because it, it just it was canceled. It, it went. Yeah, it's canceled or they put it on indefinite hold for one reason or another. Um, and, it, you know, people spent months of their, their life, you know, toiling over this stuff um, for, for basically nothing. Mm -hmm. And no, we don't talk about those, those things. We don't talk about it's because, you know, uh, I had one that was based on uh, Sin City. It was um, uh, Nancy. And Miramax, Miramax and Jessica Alba both had to approve the likeness and the sculptor, not going to name names, sculptor made it look like something he would do versus making it look like Jessica Alba. 
Mm. And their their response once I got the piece was, "Well, you can you can make it look like her in paint. You can you can alter the likeness in paint." <laughs> and I'm like, maybe if it was in color, but I don't know if you noticed, Sin City is all in grayscale. Uh huh. It's all it's gray tones. I I can't change the bone structure and the way that light and shadow works on a three dimensional object with the gray tones. Not really. Um, so the problem was in the sculpt and how the sculpt got approved and pushed into paint. I have no idea. So I was the scapegoat on that one. It never got approved. Um, it, it the project got scrapped. Uh, and in, in, because of that, I think the whole line ended up not happening. Um, so there's times as a professional where you can feel responsible. Um, your self-esteem is constantly being tested by the, by art directors, Mm -hmm. And and by the the collectors as well. Um, so to your point about the the you know the comment where I I came back and responded, um, that happens a lot. And you have to be a little graceful. You have to remember that it's not personal. It it doesn't mean that you're not a good artist, mm -hmm. um, or that or that you didn't do your job even. Um, there's a lot of communication. There's a lot of expectation, and you don't you don't really know if what the license holder wants truly made its way to the project manager and that there was a correct understanding there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And from there, what's your relationship as an artist with your project manager or your art director? If there's a, if there's a communication breakdown there as well, then what I'm doing all the way up the ladder to the, to the license holder, right. there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's when projects have delays and end up getting frozen and, and, or never happen. Um, in my experience, that's, that's one of the more common reasons. So now, um, how long have you been doing professional work? Since like 2010, okay. I think I, I always forget what year it was. Um, so how did you start it? How it actually came to be, I know that you said you, you came from in the military and you started doing some work here and there, but how do you yeah. went full time into what you do now? How did you make that choice? Well, I was, I was doing, a lot of stuff. My local comic shop was, uh, that's when, when Bowen and DC direct DC direct both started doing a lot of the, the pre paint statues when mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that stuff really took off. Yeah. Um, um, even earlier than, than 2010, but in the years before when it all started, uh, in the early two thousands, late, late nineties, early two thousands, I think is when you had like the William Paquette pieces from, yep. and, and Tim Bruckner pieces yeah, from for Vertigo and you know, DC. Right. And uh, Bowen had been doing things for Dark Horse. He had been doing cold cast porcelain model kits. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also worked with a company called, uh, I think, Creative License, him, Claiborne Moore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, was a, there was another sculptor. I'm, I'm not remembering his name. Uh, but uh, they did a few early pieces. Like there was a Rogue and a Psylocke and a Wolverine and a Gambit. Um, and so that really woke me up like, Oh, okay. Like this, you know, now this stuff is, is high end. Like you're a mm -hmm. you know, hundred, a hundred dollars yeah. for this yeah. thing. I can't even, I can't even play with. I can't even <laughs> like interact with it. It just goes on a shelf and people pay that like, well, hell I, I want to get into that. So they, yeah, that comic shop would get um, broken or damaged pieces. And back then it wasn't as easy as it is now to just say, you know, Hey, my thing is damaged, replace it. Mm -hmm. um, they would, they would either give you credit or they would just say tough shit. Mm hmm. So my comic shop owner would have damaged Bowen pieces and say, Hey, can you do something with this? Either fix it or repaint it totally or customize it. And I said, yeah, I, yeah, I can play with that. I can do that. So I st started off pretty clunky. Like it was, there was, there was nothing impressive mm -hmm. out of the gate. Like it was kind of like I would bring it in and all the, the comic shop workers would gather around the, the main uh, table at the front. And they would all look at it and turn it around, and they're like, eh, it's, uh, "Yeah, it's it's okay." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I gotta, I'm working on it." So I, I just, I dedicated a few years where, like, you know, the, I've never been a social butterfly anyway. I've never been big on like going out with groups or, right. or doing, you know, uh, social things. I've been kind of a an introvert. Mm -hmm. So I just bought more supplies. Um, there was a magazine called uh, Modeler's Resource and okay. another magazine called Amazing Figure Modeler. Okay. Um, that were dedicated to teaching people how to build 
and, and paint vinyl and resin model kits. Mm -hmm. So I started grabbing those up, back issues of those as much as I could, and poured myself into that um, and experimented as well, taking what they were doing there and say, well, that sounds good, but what if I did it this way? Or what if I take it a step further? Or what if I try this material instead? Because I don't have access to that material. Um, and it all just kind of grew from there. I'd, I didn't know any better because I didn't have anyone teaching me. Um, no one would really answer my questions. They mm -hmm. all kind of, was like, I don't know, these are secrets, boy. We don't just give this away. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all mystical and whatnot. So, uh, so yeah, I, I just kind of played around until I, I came up with my own way of doing things that looked right to me. And I noticed that I got much better responses. Uh, and I felt, I felt more confident about my work. And the more confident you get, the more you want to do. Mm -hmm. So as you have success and, and as you progress, your output increases because now it's all you can think about. You, the, the, mm -hmm. you get better at it. And now that's all you want to do. Every, every free moment that you have is I can't wait to go back and finish that paint job, or I can't wait to go back and re-sculpt that costume or whatever. Um, so that led to, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, doing projects for, uh, collectors at the comic shop and then into the internet uh doing private commissions for collectors who would contact me um you know online and they would say hey how much would you charge to repaint this i ended up doing like 15 bowen repaints in a year uh and then i got an iphone and i got facebook and i was like i'm, I'm buying all these bowen pieces everybody else is buying all these bowen pieces and they're just coming out one after another I'm like, man, I want to get in on this. I want to do this. I hate my job. Mm -hmm. um, my job, I, was, I wasn't meant for that kind of work. And I felt like I was meant for this. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, well, how do I get in this? I don't know anybody. I have no connections. Yeah. I don't have any friends in the industry. Like, I'm nobody. I'm just some kid in Ohio mm -hmm. you know, who's just obsessed with a thing. And I didn't know if it was a phase or if I would eventually, if, it, if I would burn out or whatever. But, uh. I decided to go on Facebook and contact Randy and show him some of my stuff. And then I just asked him for some work and he, he said, yeah, he said, yeah, it looks good. Like, let's get you started. Um, and he was very gracious and very patient with me. I was, you know, I was, I was a little too, too ready, but not ready. Yeah. Um, you know, and he, he tolerated me kind of, going off on a tangent once on the phone saying, well, I was thinking, and I'm telling him like my thoughts on how I'm going to attack this paint job. And he let me speak. <laughs> and then <laughs> at the, at the end he goes, okay, well, let me tell you what I want. And I, then that moment it clicked and I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. It's Bowen designs, not Bradley designs. He, <laughs> he's going to, he's giving you an opportunity and all you can do is tell him how you're going to do it. When he didn't ask you to like, mm -hmm. he doesn't want that. He wants you to do what, what he wants you to do. Mm -hmm. Like clearly he knows and you don't. And I'm, and I, it was humbling. Cause I'm like, damn, you, like, I felt like maybe I kind of blew it. Um, but he's, he's always been super cool. Um, you know, he tolerated it and I'm sure it's not the first time it's happened. Um, okay. But yeah, so I, I worked with him for about a year, um, did a couple pieces and, and got, got to see what it's like to have deadlines and I'm working a full-time job and had a wife and a, a young daughter and trying to squeeze in my dream in there. And it didn't, it didn't work right away. Everything kind of fell apart. Um, and I went through a, a pretty rough spell and I thought, okay, well that's over. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, somewhere in the middle, I decided, no, it's not. And uh, got in touch with Eric Sosa and started working with him. And it was mm -hmm. a rocky start with, there was some drama with the the street fighter stuff Started doing Kodo with Eric. Uh, then I caught the eye of uh, Diamond Select Toys, who mm -hmm. they do a ton of product. Oh, they do. And then I got to move away from just doing statues into uh, action, action figures, figures. and vi vinyl collectibles. Um, there was a line of product with them uh, that they started. They Everyone knew the mini mates that started with, mm -hmm. uh, Art, with Art Asylum. Uh, Digger Mesh and, and all those guys mm -hmm. started, you know, Zach Oat, um, Robert Yee, they all started these these mini mates. So Diamond did their own upscaled version of their called Vinny Mates, which were vinyl, sort of like bobblehead versions, but they, they were the heads were posable, but the bodies weren't. Uh, and they got the license for 
uh, quite a bit of the the eighties movie mm-hmm. properties. They did Ghostbusters, uh, Back to the Future, Predator, Alien, um, Lost in Space, and then we eventually did Elf and Beetlejuice, um, Iron Giant. So I got to work on the entire first wave of this whole uh, brand new product line, which was new to me. So I, I didn't know how that worked. I'd never really worked with um, color callouts or character turnarounds or anything like that. Nothing on paper. It was all usually like um, a verbal conversation, this type of yellow, this type of green, or they would give me comic book reference and say, mm-hmm. just do it, do it like this. Um, since most of the stuff I did was comic book related, but now we're dealing with movies and, and cartoons. So that was a, a, a learning experience as well. Um, there's a whole other kind of licensing issue. Um, and, you know, we did some model kits that didn't take off. The Deadpool ended up being produced, but the Thor and the, uh, uh, the Iron Man, the Iron Man was kick-ass. Joe Mena did this really awesome Iron Man. Joe it was Man supposed to good. be a, yeah, he's awesome. Uh, a little snap together plastic model kit. And I, I got the pleasure of doing the prototype for that. And it made its way to Toy Fair but it never saw production, which was a shame because it mm-hmm. was, I think people would have liked it. Um, we did a lot, a lot of that stuff. And then Sideshow. Uh, once that happened, I was like, holy crap. Like that was, you know, Mecca for me. Yeah. Um, but something that I, I feel is really important to anyone who's a uh, budding artist in any, in any industry, as much as you look up and, you, and that name is in bright shining lights, whether it's like a Disney or a Marvel comics or a DC comics or whatever, um you know it it seems there's some some romance and there's some smoke and mirrors going on Mm -hmm. uh and you think you really want that and to you that means well if i can get to that level i've arrived Mm -hmm. and and some of that's true but what i think most people find is once you're there it's 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 not so much getting your foot in the door it's not about getting your opportunity to show what you can do it's about maintaining that Mm-hmm. But pe- people don't understand how hard it is. You can get that first or second job that you'll get those first couple of gigs, but getting the call back, mm-hmm. that's the hard part. Having any kind of longevity in this industry, yeah. it's, t- it's, it's, it's ridiculously hard because from the top all the way down, people are, are fickle. People are flaky. Mm-hmm. One, one minute you're hot, next minute you're not. And you don't know why no one can explain it. It's not because you dropped the ball. It's not because you didn't try or that, you know, you didn't you're deliver. Not good, yeah. yeah. It's just for whatever reason, you're not, you're either not on their radar now or they've moved on to something else or their motivations have changed or uh, who, I mean, who knows? Um, yeah. yeah. Like for example, I, I've noticed this, um, and I, you know, with, I'm going to use Saisha, for example, something that I noticed, uh, like you were mentioning a lot of names and I remember when I started collecting and some years back, it's not even that far back, but there was a time where you kind of knew every one that was part of this industry. You knew the names, the sculptors, the painters, you knew right. the representatives of the company, but now these companies have expanded, exploded in a way where they have a lot of people on the payroll, a lot of people on their social media feed. They don't, necess- they don't necessarily know much about sculpting or what's in tales or where the, the beginnings of the company. So they're going after a different market, which is uh, the the new generation, the millennials or whoever is now into collecting because that's what they want to reach out. They want to reach out to this new consumer base. They want to bring these people so they can, can become consumers. So it's like it's a totally different world now. Um, so like when I talk to you, when I listen to you and you're talking about it, to me, it's like, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, like going back into some years ago where it was an easier thing to understand, or at least, you know, about artists, you, it's like, it was a small circle of people, but now yeah. it's like, there's so many people out there and there's the expectations are changing. Companies are doing things like, for example, that's not one thing that I noticed with SciShow. Now they pretty much distribute for everyone. And they have a lot of lines, not necessarily the things that we care much about or the classic sculpt, uh, you know, statue collector cares. So they sell clothing, you know, par- apparel. They, they sell all sort of things that don't necessarily are um, things that I care much about. Uh, but at the same time, I understand that this community has grown so much and there's, um, you know, there are people for everything. There is someone for like wants this or wants that. 
and then you have to reach out to everyone and it feels that to me that it's becoming uh, crowded but at the same time it's it, it, I'm not in your position so I, I cannot really say but it feels that it's harder even to find work in this environment because there's so many people working already there what is your opinion on that it, it can be if you're if you're not established and if, if you've never really worked for anyone before um, the one thing you have going for you and and you know every everyone knows this is this is kind of common sense if you're newer um, you're probably more willing to take less money and do more work, mm -hmm. which I was in the beginning. Um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to get in that circle, um, uh, you'll do twice the work for half the money. Mm -hmm. What company doesn't love that? Yeah. So if you're a newcomer, um, don't think twice that they won't kind of prey on the fact that you're naive and that you don't really know what the work is worth. Mm -hmm. There's nobody out there telling you, I mean, even I just, I was just talking to another painter about this two days ago. There's no one in place. There's no artist union saying, okay, if you're going to paint quarter scale statues for any company. That's your standard. You know, but yeah. There's a standard. This, you should be making around this much per figure or this much an hour mm -hmm. or this much a week for however long it takes you to complete. And then there's revisions. If you do it once and there's aspects that don't get approved, the belt buckle, the dirt on the boots, skin tones off eyes look weird blah 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 you got to go back and do all those changes at some point if the changes get to be a little heavy there's a point where everyone asks himself so whose fault is that and as as the the person responsible for doing the work on the paint job at what point do i feel like i should ask for more money mm -hmm. if i'm doing more work you know um so then the blame game comes in. It's real easy. And I won't say it's unprofessional, but, you know, it, it can be a really thin line uh, in knowing how to communicate with your art director and say, hey, I feel like some of these last couple changes weren't my fault. Like, I gave you what you asked for, but your license holder just doesn't, doesn't like what they saw. And that's not my fault. I didn't fail. They're just mm -hmm. not happy with what they asked for the change. Now they don't like it. I don't want to do it twice and get paid once. So I should be compensated. You know, most of them will say, no, you're right. Sometimes it can be sketchy and they're not really wanting to do, do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's where you kind of have to know your, know your client as well. Everyone will talk about bad artists or, you know, oh, don't hire this guy. He's too slow. Don't hire this guy. He costs too much. Don't hire this guy. Cause he's bad at this. Um, so, you know, there's collectors out there or there's, there's, um, art directors within the companies who will put labels on artists um, uh, and, and kind of judge us a little bit. But on the flip side, no one talks about who's a bad client. Who's like amongst artists. Mm -hmm. Who do you say like, Oh, have you ever worked for this company? Who's your art director? Oh, don't, I won't work for him because a, B and C. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not a conversation. A lot of people are privy to. And that's kind of like, if you want to get yourself ousted real quick or get a target on your back, Go, go ahead and openly have that conversation. Correct. You know, as an artist who's trying to make a living, talk about the people who want to waste your time and are cheap and, and want something for nothing. You'll, you'll see. Like they don't, nobody wants that. Nobody wants to. But at the same time, um, if you're doing 3D printing, you don't want to let other 3D printers find out that you're out there doing it for a third of the cost because now you're devaluing their work. Mm -hmm. you're, you're ruining their ability to make the money that they should be making same with sculptors same with painters same with mold with mold makers the the downside to coming in as the new guy and undercutting all the established artists is now you're hurting their their bottom line as well you're you're taking the value out of the work that ever, all the ones before you have done and you're basically cheapening everything saying well i'll do it for this much so now these companies see that and they're like well this the new blood they'll do it for $300 less. Let's hire a bunch of these guys. They say they want the work. They want to be cool. They want to eat at the cool kids table. So mm -hmm. let's let them. And when they do that, now all of your veterans, all your established guys who are used to making a certain amount, we all know the value. Now we have a hard time getting that, that, that price when we quote a price because the companies mm -hmm. have alternatives. They have options now. So yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. I want to encourage people uh, like like Louis Villamar, I've been encouraging him for years. Yeah, I've been giving him tips, and I've been helping him along. He's come a long way. He's doing great. Yeah. Um, and I, I warn him all the time. I've, I've been telling him, 
since the start. Like, be very careful because all this stuff is – these people are going to start blowing smoke up your ass and trying to be your friend because they want what you have. But I promise you they don't want to pay for it and they don't want to wait for it. Correct. You know? It, it kind of feels like when you mention it, um, it, re it reminds me a little bit of the – comics in, in one way because uh, you know the sculpting and all this is connected um but with comics are you know like you know for example back in the 90s or even before that uh some of the greatest artists of all time they never got paid the real money for their work and of course back in the 90s that's when you saw this influx of many new artists that they could do it for less and that's the reason why of course uh you know uh jim lee and all of those guys went and created image comics but then in the 90s you saw a lot of really bad artists, a lot of artists that they were trying to imitate the art and they kind of did, some of them did it right. Others didn't do it right. So you saw a lot of trashy comics and most of it has to do with the art itself. You know, the other people trying to copy the others, you know, Marvel and DC not really paying good money, just giving contracts here and there, uh, you know, just to keep it low because they didn't want to repeat the same situation that happened with those guys at image comics. You know, they, they wanted more money for their work. And I feel that in some ways, I notice that now in the statue collecting world where uh, I do see a lot of new commerce, a lot of new artists. It seems like companies are hiring these new guys and many of the sculptors are, I wouldn't say most of the sculpts are there. I like the concept, but the, the execution in the end, the art and even the pain sometimes is not as good. So I feel that there's something there that is happening. Also, I feel like. Some of the greatest artists, like like you were mentioning, like Joe Mena, for example. Joe Mena is one of the best sculptors I've known. And there are many artists that don't really get as much uh, opportunities nowadays like they did before. Because now you have newcomers and you have a lot of 3D stuff. You know, the classic sculpting is kind of out the window for 3D modeling. and Which I like 3D modeling. I'm not nothing against it. But it seems that it's the easiest way for them to make more money. They spend less money on that. Uh, they save time. And that's the reason you see a lot of it. And But there's a lot of, like you were saying early on, um, a lot of stuff that when it comes to you as a painter, it's like, you, I, don't, I, don't, I cannot fix it. I cannot fix something that is, was poorly done from the get-go. And ultimately, I feel that you get blamed. The same way that when we, I think the problem here is because we don't see painters in this industry, in this hobby, as important as we do sculptors. I feel that uh, we undervalue the work of a painter um the same happens with in comics when we always talk about the the artists the ones that they draw like you know jim lee or whoever but we don't think about the inkers uh exactly we don't think about the colorists the people that actually have to embellish the work and you have a big part of it because if your pain is you know the pain is terrible then nobody wants to buy the piece so right. in the end you're the one that gets um uh, penalize if people don't want something although it might not be your problem it might be that you tried your best to fix something that it was unfixable you know the sculpt was terrible but you did your best like you were saying about that statue um for sin city you know it's i think that that's the case it, it feels i feel that we have this tendency to blame the painters because it's easier to blame the painter rather than really accepting that the sculpt was trash well that's I, I'll agree with that. Um, you know, we go start back with the uh, the comic reference. Like, mm -hmm. I, I came from the comic world. I actually tried to be an inker okay. for a few years, and I was I was decent. I got some job offers, but what I found was I wasn't fast enough. Okay. The rate at which you have to be able to to produce finished pages, it's like a page to a page and a half a day minimum. You have to be very fast, and I just wasn't. So I, I bailed on that. I just I said, I'll do it for fun. You know, yeah. I, I'm not going to make it as a professional. But in doing my homework, I started noticing when I would get my hands on penciled pages, I started noticing the difference between using Jim Lee and Scott Williams. That's a perfect example. That's the best right. one to use. When you look at Jim Lee's breakdowns and his pencils alone, mm -hmm. and then you see what, what Scott does over yeah. top of that. A lot of the polish, a lot of the line work that you're seeing is not Jim. It's Scott. Yeah. What you're seeing is Scott. And right. I, I went to San Diego Comic-Con in, in 2018 and Scott Williams was there and he has pieces that are all just him. Mm -hmm. The dude can draw, the dude can draw it. It mm -hmm. almost, I mean, it's not exact, but especially with faces, Jim has his own way of faces, mm -hmm. but the bodies and the backgrounds, I, you just, you could almost swear that Jim drew it, but it's not Jim, it's Scott. So 
and you know the same could be said with Joseph Rubenstein, Terry Austin. Correct. Um, there, there's a, a lot of inkers who, uh, you know, really made people's work shine. Like if you look at Walsh Portacio, and then, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think Art uh, Art T Bear. Or, Stewart, or, yeah. No, the the inker Art T Bear was a. It looks it's spelled Cybert, but I, I believe it's pronounced T Bear. Correct. Um, he could draw on his own as well. Mm-hmm. But his inking style was very smooth and clean and sharp. So when he would ink over Walsh's work or or Jim's or anybody else's, um, it, it gave it that nice slick that look that everyone was mimicking in the '90s. That not from 1991 to 97, 98, you had all these these Jim Lee and Scott Williams clones out there. Mm-hmm. And and before that, it was you know everybody trying to be like John Byrne, um, or uh, or um, uh, I'm having a brain fart. John John Romita or Senior, not Junior. His stuff's trash. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyway, you you get what I'm trying to say. Yes. The, the inker the inker definitely has a an influence over the the look of the finished artwork. And as painters, we have that as well. A little something that I don't think most people know though about that is that at the factory level, when you're producing a product, the more paint apps you have on that on that paint master. Mm-hmm. the higher the price of the of the final product, product. Mm-hmm. so if i'm trying to keep my uh my statue within a certain price point i have to let my painter know hey yes i want you to make this look good and i want you to use the detail that's there and i want you to bring out and accent the all the the work that the sculptor did but if if you do too many steps if it's too many layers if you know mm-hmm. every step that you do that they have to mimic costs me more Mm. which raises the price of the of the product when it finally goes to retail. I see. So they may come in and say dumb it down, which doesn't mean make it look stupid. I mean it just it just means like find ways to simplify. And as a painter, there's something to be said about having the knowledge of knowing how to still get the maximum uh effectiveness in the paint job without doing all the layers and all the steps in it just goes back to modeling basics. It goes back to the fact that there's guys who didn't spend a lot of time doing model kits or anything. They kind of just jumped in head first and did a couple decent paint jobs and decided, okay, well, I'm going to start charging money for this because it's not half bad. Mm-hmm. And kudos to those guys. But at the same time, um, when you start trying to compete on the same level as like Steve Riojas or Rick Cantu mm-hmm. uh, or John Allred or Jeff Camp, um, you know, these are guys who I'm just like, you're, I just want to tell them all, like, you're not there yet. Slow down. And mm-hmm. I'm not trying to bash anybody's work or say that they're not going to get there, but you know, ease up, just mm-hmm. shut your mouth, paint a little more, keep getting better. You know, if you want to ask for help, ask some of the, the veterans for advice, ask them for some tips They're, They'll either give them to you or they won't. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, take that frustration and use it as motivation to figure it out yourself and get better. Like there's a lot going on right now. I've noticed with, with the newer guys where guys, my age and older, we had to seek out knowledge and we had to do trial and error and we had to be willing to fail over and over again. And these guys don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. They, they come to me and they want answers now. They want results now. And they want me to take my years of, of messing up Mm -hmm. and learning on my own and just hand it to them for free so they can go post it on the internet and get all the pats on the back. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, I guess I'm petty because I don't like that. Mm -hmm. If you got it from me, I want my credit. Correct. You're using, you're using my, my technique and my knowledge and my advice. Then, then don't go make it seem like you did that all on your own. Mm -hmm. I want that. I want that credit too. So people know that not only, yes, I'm willing to share where some artists aren't willing to share, but you know, I, I I want them to know that you didn't just. This isn't all just you, because now they start assuming you have uh, an ability that you don't really have. Mm-hmm. It's like plagiarism, sort of. Correct. Um, you know, so yeah. Um, and and with the digital the digital age coming in, there are sculptors who have like f- most recently the Silver Surfer that Daniel Bell did for Sideshow. Mm-hmm. He he caught so much shit for that. I felt bad for him, and I'm glad he did what I would have done he publicly went out to everyone and said, Hey, I was asked to do a job. Mm-hmm. I, my art was controlled. I was art directed. I was told, Hey, 
you know, do it like this, do it like that. And if I had some input, my input was ultimately either approved or not approved. So everything you see here is a combination of my aesthetic as a sculptor, you know, the, the, the anatomy that I was going for, and also the concept that was given to me by the people who hired me. Mm -hmm. and if, you, if you guys don't like it, then, hey, sorry, don't buy it. But don't sit here and openly just bash Correct. the work that we do because it's super disrespectful. It is. And, and that's what a lot of these collectors, what, if, if anything I want to say to collectors, you know, in this podcast is they don't realize how condescending they can be to us. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they mean to, but mm -hmm. with the way they talk to us, and I've, I've spoken to other artists, it's like as soon as they hire you, they give you a deposit, they send you their model kit. They act like they, they own you or that they're like mm -hmm. somehow responsible for you and your time management. Um, they feel like they get to bother you anytime they want, multiple times a week. And if they see you on Facebook spending time with your family or going out and having fun, they're like, well, I've been waiting six months for my mm -hmm. statue. You're out here having ice cream with your kids. What are you thinking? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, what was I thinking? Silly me. Like, yes, you hired us to do a job, but we have lives. And we have other priorities. Um, the, the main point that I want to make is that, you know, yeah, you work hard for your money, but so do I. Correct. And when you come at me disrespectful or you talk down to me like you own me, um, you're not going to encourage me to do my best work. And I'm probably going to just rush it out the door to call it done so I don't have to deal with you anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just being honest. Correct. Um, there's a lot of collectors too will try to tell you how to run your business or how to manage your time or they'll say well then don't take on so many projects well then pay me more so i don't have to so mm -hmm. i don't have to overlap my schedule or so that i don't have to say if a company comes along with a paying job and i'm in the middle of painting your model kit that you're only paying me 800 dollars to paint but they're going to pay me 13 to do mm -hmm. the same work guess what mm -hmm. your project's going on the shelf i'm mm -hmm. i'm done with you for now and i'm going to accommodate them because they're paying me better and they treat me better. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm done with that, I'll get back to you and on and on and on. So, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I think most artists are upfront about their policies and the way they work. And I think some collectors need to take a step back and realize that you're going through all of this. And what are you going to do when you, you finally get your piece? You're going to get it. You're going to feel some kind of way about it. You'll have it for maybe a couple of months. Mm-hmm probably not a year you'll either sell it or you'll trade it all right and you'll move on to the next obsession so stop treating us like crap over plastic exactly you you've all proven that it's not that important to you mm -hmm. so, so while i'm working on it stop stressing me out in my personal life for something you're not even going to hang on to for a year now this is and another you, thing and, uh -huh. no, i'm sorry that's it. No, you're fine. <laughs> now another thing that you mentioned and i think it's important um that you brought it up um <laughs> That I think it's something that uh, it's happening, and I think it's we are in a new phase of this hobby. Um, I remember, you know, when I, you know, back in the day where we only had the forums to talk with people, uh, mm -hmm. it was just like you open the screen or on your phone or your computer and you go there, you have a conversation. There are also certain things that you could say and things that you cannot say because if you know you get deleted or whatever, so it was like you have this particular face or the time of day where you actually go through the forum and go through the comments and look at certain stuff and you, you know, you bring your opinion down, you know, you just share your opinion. But that was about it. Now we have this 24 seven with us. And I feel that, like you said, like I have a lot of friends on my Facebook and I'm sure you do. You are my friend on Facebook. We've been friends forever. This is the first time we talk person to person, at least through this medium. Uh, we have had conversations uh, pretty much on Facebook and stuff. Uh, private messaging, but um, now it's like you carry all these people with you wherever you go. And like you said, they're now part of your life. So whatever you do in your personal life, they know what you're doing. And right. if it seems to me that now people feel they need to be blunt about certain things with you and they feel yeah. that they, they know you, although they don't know you, but right. they come to you as if like they have some control over your life and they're telling you what you need to do. They send you messages in the middle of the night. They don't even, they're not mm -hmm. considerate about if it maybe the weekend you have to go with family, spend time with family. They just yeah. think that they have the, the time or that because then now you're friends supposedly on Facebook. Exactly. Now they have control over your life. And I feel that this is a, a face in this hobby where I'm not so keen because I used to be like when Facebook groups started popping up, I was participating. I was becoming friends with people. 
but it became such a, a juggernaut of an investment of time where you feel like this is taking your time and you're not yeah. investing time in what you need to do or and to really, you know, really nourishing yourself because you need time. I imagine as an artist, you need time for yourself to replenish yourself so that can really be reflected in the work you do. What do you think about right. that? About well, um, ask my wife about that. How many times <laughs> in the middle of the night, uh, my, my Facebook messenger goes, ting, and she's like, God damn it. Like, <laughs> do these people not have lives? Do they not think like what she feels like I'm too accessible? Mm. And that people don't know that there's boundaries. And like you said, they think we're friends when we're not friends. Um, I, I recently had a collector that I, he, he never, he never really hired me to do anything. Not recently. He hired me once way back when. And then like, as I was working on his kit, he sold it off to someone right from underneath me. And then also sold the other two kits that I had that I was going to do for him which I thought was kind of, eh. And then after that, he'd always come around kind of kicking the tires, you know, like mm -hmm. he would want uh, to, the, the point I'm getting at is, is these guys will expect you to respond. They want to correspond with you and they, they don't realize like, Hey, this is how I make a living. This, my time is money. Right. And there's a lot of you out there. So if you look at all of the conversations I have in a day about this stuff, and most of you don't even bring your business. You come to me, you'll say, hey, how's it going? You know, love your work. And you, you're already starting off trying to butter me up. Give me compliments. You ask me how much. It's pretty clear you don't like my price. Or I'll tell you, well, I can't even start it till December. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, and if a company comes along, I'm going to stop on your thing. And I'm going to work on theirs. Um, we finish out the conversation. And then I usually never hear from them again. But this guy would always come back and just keep doing it and doing it and ask me to talk to other artists for him and get me to comment on projects in his group and, you know, even did like a little uh, article thing on me about how good friends we are. And, you know, and so I just, I unfriended him because he's a big time suck. He's just a big waste of time. Mm -hmm. He was never going to hire me he was, and he didn't do anything to benefit me in any way, shape or form. And I really, I, the guy's just kind of spaz. So I unfriend him and he gets pissed because I didn't let him know that I unfriended him or explain mm. to him why I unfriended him. Then he goes on social media and outs me and names me and tells everyone what I did to him, how he tried to be a good friend. And you know, this just shows what a bad person he is because I, I brought him work and I helped his career. And I'm like, oh, you helped my career? You did that? Oh, I thought I did that by myself. Mm. My bad. Um, so it was silly to me because I, I wasn't even going to respond to it. And I didn't. And I'm bringing it up now just to make the point of I don't get paid to deal with that, but I deal with it a lot. Mm -hmm. It interrupts my dinner. It interrupts my sleep. It mm -hmm. interrupts my, my productivity while I'm working during the day in my studio. Because on the flip side, you can't be unavailable right. or you have the other problem of collectors will just stop. Word of mouth. It gets around real fast. Like, you know, mm -hmm. if nothing else, these collectors, boy, they can talk. They can you talk. Know? It's way good wildfire, um, you know, and that's good, but it, it's also it can be negative if you, if you turn it that way. So I try to exist. I want to exist somewhere in the middle where I'll talk to you if I have time to talk to you and I'll make time for you if I have it. Um, but if I don't, you know, people got to stop feeling like, you know, they get offended or they're like, Oh, so hello. Are you, are you ignoring me? Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the worst thing about all of this is that, Facebook made the thing where when someone reads your message, the little circle drops down. Yeah. Let's... So now you guys, you can see, well, Ed saw my message, but he hasn't responded. Yeah. Well, why is he being a dick? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm not, I'm just, I was, know, I was driving and all of a sudden I, I was driving it. or, you know, um, my dogs are fighting and they, you know, my one, I have two uh, half pits and they fight and mm -hmm. now one's bleeding and I don't want blood on my carpet or I'm trying to have dinner or my kids are fighting, or my teenager's having a meltdown right now. Um, there's all kinds of reasons why, but it's like people don't see that. Oh, they, they only see it from their side, and they think I'm just some monkey in a dungeon with a paintbrush, <laughs> and that, that that's all I do. And, and I'm like, no, that's not my life. But, you know, perception is everything. It is. Uh, and I'm not exactly the most open about I mean, I'll talk, obviously, I'm pretty open 
You are. When you talk to me, if you ask me a question, I'm not going to bullshit you or give you a, a false answer or, or omit information. Um, for the most part, yeah, I know the difference between what's personal and private and what you can talk about. And when it comes to my career and my personal life on the outside, I'll talk about all of that stuff because it, it all, it's all intertwined. When you're a working artist for hire, there is no separation. There can't be. Right, you, right. have to be on, you have to be on the clock 24-7. And that's the side of it where I have to be understanding. And as much as it sounds like I'm, on the one hand, I'm ranting about all these persistent collectors. Um, comes with the territory. And every sculptor and every painter will tell you, that's just how it is. If you can't deal, get out. That's right. Don't do it. Don't do, you know, I've told Lewis that a lot of times. Hey, man, then, then, then quit. Then stop. Then don't do it. If, if you can't handle it, then you can always hang it up. Nobody's making you do this. Mm -hmm. You chose to. So you have to take the good with the bad. You, it's all a package deal. You've got really awesome collectors. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, you know, yourself, uh, James Tavegia or Tavik Bond. I'll, yes. I'll name these guys. Um, you know, you got like Josh Zim and Steve Rowe and um, I'm probably going to forget some names, but, um, you know, there's a lot of guys on my list who don't do all of these things I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They're very respectful. They do give me leeway. They let me kind of put my own spin on, on what I'm doing, what they ask me to do. Um, they'll ask for updates, but they're, they're respectful about the way they ask for updates. They're not mm -hmm. demanding about it. You know what I mean? It's like, yes. it's more of just an organic conversation. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? How's the family? Have you had any time to work on my thing? Do you have any updates? Okay, cool. I was just checking in, you know, hope everything's going all right. I'll talk to you later. And that's it. I think you're mentioning, um, uh, you know, the, the names you mentioned, the, many of them also friends of mine. Uh, but sure. you're mentioning this on Facebook, of course. Uh, and I Tabic, for example, I, I've you know met him on the forums, you know, and, and I think you're talking about people that have been in, in this hobby for quite some time. They have learned to they have understood from the get go or they have seen through the experience that this is how it you know works. You know, it's not an easy thing. I feel that now we have this influx of new uh, collectors that they have this total different impression of things and expectation. They have this high expectations. They want things just like that, uh, but this I think this is the new mentality that is being brought into the hobby where they feel that technically you can actually paint something in one day and they don't realize that it takes a lot of work. It's many hours that you have to put into it. It's a lot of into the process. And like you said, you know, you have other projects to work on. You're a freelancer, so you have to be, bu you're busy doing other things. But I feel that now, I feel that the people have less patience in regards to what it, you know, takes to do the work and i do see it all the time that's the reason people go into these rants on on facebook all the time that's the reason why i only read the comments i don't even reply anymore because i got tired of trying to you know you're fighting people back that they are angry because you're in one way you're defending a the work of someone because you know that person like i, I used to be this type of person that if i seen someone insulting a sculptor a painter or saying this is garbage I would just jump in and says, hey, wait a minute. You don't know this artist. This person has been in the business for a long time. I know this person. I know this person is does good work and maybe there was something there. And then you have to defend yourself against not the person that is making the attacks, but also you have to defend yourself against 20 more that they just decide to get into in the conversation, but they have no idea what they're talking about. So I feel that right. this is the part where uh, and most of the time nowadays I just go through the, the groups or I just simply take the notifications out because I don't want to be bothered, you know, reading the comments. Um, I do feel that it's important to respect the artists and the painters and the sculptors in the end, because you do the work without you. There's no way we can do what we have, what we have. I don't think right. if we don't have artists, then we have no hobby. There's nothing to collect. Right. So I feel right. that they have to be an open, uh, you know, open communication between both of us. Yes. There are things that we can disagree on. There are things that we say, Hey, can you do this better? But there has to be a it really a sense of respect in that and from the get go in the conversation. So now let me ask right. you this. Now going back into something more technical, because you were mentioning, you know, you've been doing this for a long time for sure. And, you know, you you know some of the the you know, you know a lot of the the people that have been very important for this hobby. But I yeah. know that through all of this, um, there has to be something that you like to paint a lot. Is there anything, any type of franchise or any license or any products that you love to paint? Oh yeah. Um, me personally, there, there was a model company 
uh, called Future Models. Okay. And they were they were represented here in the U.S. by a, a like a, a subsidiary called Artstorm USA. Uh, the the main the main sculptor for all this stuff. Uh, his last his name is Takeo or Takia. Okay. Uh, a lot of people know of him. They've probably seen his work. Um, but he's 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 a very prolific, a very original, one of a kind uh, type of sculptor. He's inspired almost all of the sculptors in the U.S. that that do this stuff now, especially like the Shiflet brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to them about you know talk to Brandon Shiflet about Takia. Um, he'll he'll tell you how important he is to what we do. But uh, the creature designs a lot of um, mm-hmm. Yash- Yashushi Nirasawa. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a sculptor named Yuji Oniki. Um, there's a sculptor, um, I think his name was Takianagi. He did some stuff on like the Zerum, uh, model kits. Um, I'm into like just really weird, um, hybrid human insect type, not so much like monstrous for the sake of being monstrous, but where you can see a little bit of the humanity and, and then there's some kind of metamorphosis or there's some kind of change where it's becoming something else that uh you can tell that the human part of that character is mortified that they're turning into this thing but they can't stop it or maybe they didn't like it at first but now they like it um there's a kit called uh, pusher hopper okay and it's a grasshopper man standing his left side of his body is still sort of human mm-hmm. uh the right side is very much grasshopper and he's injecting himself in the neck with a syringe and then there's these little syringes on the ground next to him so you can see that you know he's he's turning himself into this monster mm. um for whatever reason and you get to see the part where the humanoid areas are you can you know this guy knows his anatomy he he can sculpt people but then his creativity and his ability to make this grasshopper thing look so wild and just out of this world like it's something about this balance he he's a master of he can be symmetrical but he uses asymmetry a lot in his work to really play on that. So there may be times where the the left side of the face isn't the same as the right side or one part of the body is a little bigger or smaller or um, you know, his composition's great. I love those kits. Um, I love a lot of the Japanese flavored stuff, a lot of the old anime stuff that's been redone uh, and made a little more realistic. Like mm-hmm. uh, like I, I never expected Prime 1 to get the Guyver license. Yes. To me, Guy, Guyver was always kind of obscure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Guyver was my original, like my first love of anime. I had all of the black and white comics that Viz mm-hmm. Manga did. I had all the Max Factory pre-painted vinyl figures. Yes. Um, I had the movie stuff when Steve Wang did the movies. Um, and then when they came out with those, I was like, it made me super excited, but at the same time, I'm like, is there a, is there a big enough market for these? Because I didn't know that there were that many people who gave a shit about Guyver. Guyver, yeah. It seemed kind of like out there. Um, but I'm very much into that. Um, sometimes I'll just gravitate towards a certain sculptor. And there's a lot of them. I mean, uh, Gene St. Gene, his stuff. Yes. He he could do he could do pretty much any character any B or C list character, mm-hmm. uh, and and make me want to at least paint the thing. Um, and you got Tony Cipriano who's been around for a long yes. time. Mark Newman, um, Mark Newman, his like yeah, gimme gimme, just give me something to put paint on. I love Mark's stuff, digital and traditional. Um, you know, Gabe. This is a sculptor named Gabe Perna, who mm-hmm. I think people from the Garage Kid hobby probably know of him very well, but people who statue collect may not so much know who he is but you've seen his work uh if i showed you his portfolio you'd be like oh you have seen that stuff but he's a great guy great sculptor has definitely has his own style but can also acclimate to the commercial style the mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know the style that people are used to seeing um you know uh, eric sosa um you know i've been friends with him for a long time done a lot of work for him personally i love his style as well i just love the way i wish he would do more traditional stuff i gotta say yeah. I, I still love love all these guys, uh, if they did traditional first, I'll always want their traditional work first. Right. Uh, Sam Green, Sam Greenwell, who I'm really good friends with, but mm-hmm. also Sam, Sam is a very humble guy. Uh, and he's, he's amazing. His work is, I mean, his females are fantastic. Uh, he can do superheroes. He can do like, I would say Sam is like the Norman Rockwell of, of mm-hmm. figure sculpting in, in my era. Um, he can do everything. He can take a, an artist style. Like if you say, 
take an Arthur Adams mm-hmm. drawing and, and make the sculpt look like Arthur Adams or John Byrne or Jim Lee or, you know, Frazetta or anybody. S- Sam can do it. Like Sam can, can knock it out. So anytime I get a chance to own a piece of his work for myself to potentially paint one day, I'll take it. Uh, the Schiffler brothers. Oh my God. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm into anything Schiffler. Give it, give me, give me their stuff too. Simon Lee. Um, God, there's so many, of course, Randy Bowen. Um, there was just something about that first, that original Hellboy piece that he did. Oh yeah. Full figure. I still have mine. And, uh, I've seen other sculptures of Hellboy, but I think that's the best, the most classic depiction yeah, of Hellboy in nothing, my opinion. Right. So, so, you know, Yes, there uh, there are things I enjoy painting for myself, and I definitely have a certain subject matter that I like. I'm really not into the the like cheeky, sexy female kits. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's just kind of like not not judging any of the guys. If you're into that, that's cool. Um, <laughs> but for me, it's always it's always like, eh, that's not. I don't I don't need that. Um, yeah, I think um... I'll stick with. I'll yeah. stick with the other stuff. Yeah, I think in that is because, like, for example, I'm I'm a father. <laughs> I only have a daughter. Um, uh, she's 21. But like you said, I was never really too much into the too sexy stuff or kind of like the girlish type of stuff. I found that to be a bit of a, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm not judging people. I know a lot of people love that kind of stuff. I just it was yeah. not my thing. I didn't feel like comfortable to displaying that kind of stuff. And then I have a daughter, and I try to say, hey, you know, this is the image of what a woman should be. Uh, I don't know. I just right. I felt. I think if, you know, for a lot of people, if you don't have any kids or you don't have any daughters, perhaps you don't see it the same way It's when you become a father and you have your own kid and then you trying to, I don't know, I try to represent the strong female figures for them. Um, I, right. I, I think that's been my situation. Now, let me ask you this. Like you mentioned the artists that you love and the, the things that you like to work on. Is there anything that you don't like to work on? Anything like, for example, you have a hard time sometimes... Uh, doing any type of license perhaps or perhaps any type of uh, pain work that you need to do that is gives you a hard time or you're still working on is there anything like that um dinosaurs dinosaurs okay i don't do dinosaurs you don't like dinosaurs i do not it's not that i don't like them i've i've attempted um okay i found out real quick like oh <laughs> that wasn't your I, thing I, I, no, nah, it's not in my wheelhouse, man. Um, I don't know how to approach them. I don't. Uh, it's not the same as doing a predator. I can do predator. Okay. I enjoy it. Predator is actually my favorite movie monster. Okay. Um, predator and alien are like at the top. They're you know just design wise, you know the way they look, the uh-huh. aesthetic and everything. I can paint a predator, no problem. That that's not outside of my my uh, ability or my interest. Mm-hmm something about dinosaurs because they have to i mean it's got to look real it's, it's got to mm-hmm. have a level of realism uh there's a sculptor and painter his name's shane falks i think is how you pronounce shane shane falks uh-huh. um he is ridiculous he's amazing uh steve riojas same thing I, oh, i've yeah. seen a lot, of, a lot of the dinosaur stuff that steve riojas and, and shane falks have done and if you know anybody who's looking to have dinos done Look those guys up on Facebook. They're they're mm. they're the best. They're, they're just mind blowing what they can do. Um, you're putting uh, taxidermy eyes in them and stuff like get little bird eyes and then uh-huh. hollow out the eye socket. Oh, wow. Put the acrylic eye in and resculpt the eyelids and everything. Um, it just it just takes it to a whole other. Yeah, I suck at I suck at dinosaurs. Can't do them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like I enjoy doing animals. Um, I I don't get a, a lot of opportunity. Uh-huh. But I got I got to do a realistic version of Lockjaw for Mezco. Yes, for the one twelfth. Uh, yeah, the one twelfth mm-hmm. figure line. And Mez was like, "Hey, don't do it just brown like in the comic. I want you to like." They gave me reference of an of an actual. I forget what the breed is, but they said we want the the fur and everything to look like this. And I was like, "Oh, awesome! I can do that." So it it felt more like you know. I was very comfortable doing that job and it, and I did it a lot faster because you can be, it's, it's more organic. There's not any mm-hmm. masking. There's no like protecting certain parts from overspray or whatever. It's just a natural, you know, you just kind of go with it. You're very free. Do you have a, That's a, what I like. a project or anything that you haven't touched yet that you would love to do anything, any type of license or any type of product? Oh yeah. Um, 
quite a bit. <laughs> mm. Um, I've got some some rare stuff, you know. Being being friends with some of these sculptors has its advantages. I have pieces that other people don't have that aren't available. They're not mm. they weren't released, um, especially now that I've gotten into three D printing. Um, okay. So I've I've got files to things that I'll never see. Like I'll print one for the sculptor, and then I'll say, "Can I do one for me?" And they're like, "Yeah, no problem." Um, so that stuff's all on hold. Like I'm, I'm not going to get to that anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Not till things slow down a little more. A couple more years, I can start doing stuff for me. Um, but I've got uh, I've got kits where I've uh, I've had the heads uh, cast in clear resin, so I can light the eyes up and you know do my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got I've got kits for days that I have plans for to make them stand out from the typical, you know, every other paint job you've seen on that kit. But mine's going to be different because I'm different because I approach my stuff different. And the the unfortunate thing about my situation is uh, most of what you all have seen of my work is through a filter. You're seeing mm-hmm. me following directions. You're not really seeing me paint how I paint mm-hmm. or what, 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 what my, my uh, tendencies are, or what I gravitate towards or how I think it should look. Cause I don't get paid to do that really. Mm-hmm. Even with, especially with private collectors, you would think the companies would be pickier and that their private collectors would say, Hey, I trust you just do your thing. Mm-hmm. You know who tells me that? Those guys I named earlier <laughs> say, you're the artist. I trust you. Just do your thing. Make it look cool. Mm-hmm. Majority of the collectors are. I want this. I want me, that. Oh, they want the world, but they don't know what they want. And, <laughs> and they give me, I'll say, I need reference. Like show me for Captain America, show me the color blue you want for cap. And they'll show me like three or four different pieces of art where the blues are all different. Mm. There's there's no uniformity there. I'm like, no, you don't. You're not hearing what I'm saying. You're not understanding me. So it's, you know, it's it's hard to represent yourself as an artist when you make a living doing other people's vision. That's right. Ultimately, I may I make my living, you know, representing other people's vision, not mine. So I even argue with people anymore. I say, don't call me an artist. It's it's, um, I'm a little disheartened by that because at this point, I I'm a paint by numbers guy. Like, That's right. I'm a tool that companies and collectors use to accomplish a, a goal. I'm not an artist. I don't have any real freedom. I don't get an artist gets a blank canvas. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, a a worker gets a page out of a coloring book and stay inside the lines. Do these colors here, like this, mm-hmm. this, and this, and and make it look neat. And I'm happy. That's the difference. And I don't, I don't get that blank canvas. I don't ever get a kit where someone says, go crazy, do your thing. Um, now, recently, I've had a few more collectors step up. And, and when I tell them this, I, I started telling people, and I've, and I've encouraged, I know uh, Lewis has been telling people this as well, because uh, we've had this conversation, telling people, look, I'll, I'm going to own your kits. I'll follow your direction. And I'll, for the most part, I'll do what you're telling me you want me to do. Mm-hmm. But, but in the end, I'm still going to do my version of that thing. Mm-hmm. I, I need to have that outlet. I need to be able to have some control and put my own stamp on what I'm doing. If you're not okay with that, then I have to turn it down and you need to find someone else. Right. And surprisingly, when, when you stand by that, it starts to really weed everybody out. Correct. Like, it becomes very clear who respects you as an artist and who doesn't. Mm-hmm. So and to that, all I can say is uh, um, us painters talk. We're not enemies. We're friends. Mm-hmm. And we, we compare notes and we name names. So mm-hmm. if you're if you're a problem or if you're, you know, every panel will know. Yeah, like there, <laughs> we, we do. We it's, it's funny. We talk about it like we've blacklisted several collectors where you compare notes with four or five other painters. And mm-hmm. it's the same guys on the list for the same reasons. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? And there's people who might say, oh, that's bullshit. No, it's not. We reserve that right. That's that's up to us, not you. That's right. Like, like I want to tell people, if you ever say the words, the customer's always right, I don't want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Like, a customer and a client are different. I am not Walmart. I don't have a manager. Mm-hmm. You know, I am in control of my brand. Mm-hmm. I decide my day. You know, I call all the shots. Now, when you hire me, you think you call all the shots because you're the one paying me. In reality, you don't. You're not in control. I'm in control. 
And I've had to flex that control at times where I've given people their money back. I've thrown their shit back in a box and I've paid to have it shipped home. And I've said, you know what? Good riddance. I don't want to deal with you. And they lose their mind. They're like, well, how dare you? You know, the, I can't believe the audacity. And I'm like, but how did, what did you think? Did you really think you had your, your, your finger on me that you really had me held down with a $200 deposit? <laughs> like that's, that's all I, that's all I'm worth. Is mm-hmm. that come on, you gotta, you gotta get, let's get real. Mm-hmm. Right. If you don't, the only control you have is over who you hire and what you tolerate. That's it. That's right. You can put all of your, your stuff out there, but if I'm not receiving it, then it's for nothing because I'm the one that you're entrusting to do the job. You're putting your property in my hands and asking me, not telling me, you're asking me to do a job for you, you know, and based on that relationship, that's what kind of, of, uh, performance you're going to get out of me. You know, the, the meaner you are, the more rude you are, the more insistent you are, the less open I am and the less receptive I am and the less willing I am. And now all of a sudden we have a problem. Correct. And, and I'll admit at this point I should, there are, there are other guys who are probably better at handling it than I am. Um, I'm not perfect. I, I have my shortcomings for sure. And one of them is I, I don't like being talked to a certain way and I'll, I'll tolerate it a couple of times and then I'll just decide, okay, uh, now I'm going to do what I want. And I know you'll probably go on social media and tell everyone, or you'll probably tell all your friends in your group, or you, or and you'll just never hire me again. Which I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that from anybody. Um, I'm not in it to make enemies, and I'm not in it to frustrate people, and I'm not in it to make people wait ungodly amounts of time for a statue. But this is what it is. Mm-hmm. So you know, I would just hope that if anyone ever uh, has questions or problems, rather than ask someone else, just come ask me. Yeah. So, because I hear that too. I mean, when when people talk, it, it every all of this goes both ways. You don't think that if you tell another painter or another sculptor something bad that you feel about me or or any other painter that it won't get back to us? Of course it does. Mm-hmm. And now I'm looking at it as okay. Well, you didn't respect me enough to come and ask me personally. You decided to ask another collector or another artist or or tell your version of the story to them, and now I didn't get a chance to defend myself. Yeah. Until my side of it, because there's always two sides, and actually, no, there's actually three sides. There's my version, there's your version, and there's the truth. <laughs> yeah. some, somewhere, somewhere in the middle, because we all have our own, you know, personalities and perspectives. So, all right. you know, if anything, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm bashing anyone or that I'm saying that collectors are the devil. I'm just saying when you do this full time and you interact with as many people, you know, the law of averages says I'm gonna have problems. I'm gonna mm-hmm. come across some 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 you know rough rough waters if you will i just hope that collectors would understand that you know all they got to do is just level with me and you know kind of slow down mm-hmm. and uh, even if i seem like i'm being a jerk i don't mean to i, I just I, I got a lot on my plate and uh, i deal with it the best i can but you know, i make mistakes even still even as a quote-unquote professional you know just because i work for sideshow doesn't mean i got all my shit figured out i'm still just a guy <laughs> that's right that's it now um just get into more um of a personal question now um like you Mm -hmm. know we have been talking about a lot of the the hobby the industry the stuff that you have done but um what do you do normally you know for on your time off and the and your free time you know just to unwind just to clear yourself what are the things that you love to do i don't uh, to be honest i don't get a lot of that um with the kids and the dogs and my wife and my friends and family. Um, I get time to unwind with, with them. Mm-hmm. I, I don't get a whole lot of time to myself. When I work, I'm by myself. Mm-hmm. So that's supposed to be my alone time. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's no way to spend alone time. Yeah. Because you're you know? working. Yeah. You're, you're kind of invested in someone else's thing, trying to meet their expectation and not let them down and deli- really deliver and, and m- make them feel like they've spent their money wisely. But when, but yeah, my way of wi- unwinding is um, I love, I love horror movies. I like old corny horror with, you know, excessive gore and there's boobies in almost every one. <laughs> um, and like the acting is terrible and the, the, you know, the script is crap, 
but I, I grew up on that stuff. Yeah. Um, also, I like sci-fi and fantasy stuff. Uh, RoboCop is one of my favorite movies. Yeah. That I, I'll, I'll watch it over and over again. Same with Predator. The first two Predator movies, I'll watch them to just relax and chill. Um, I like anime. I like cartoons. Just you know, Ren and Stimpy is my guilty pleasure. Like I, I absolutely love Ren and Stimpy. I know some people will be like, "What? That's so lowbrow." It's just gross out humor. <laughs> yeah. But but man, I'm, I'm into it. I, I have I have a ton of Ren and Stimpy collectibles. Um, I have all the all the DVDs, everything that ever got put out. I have it. Um, as an adult on adult time, I like to go out with uh, you know my brother in law and my friend. And we usually do like, you know, once or twice a month, we'll just have a guy's night, mm -hmm. um, you know, go and get some drinks and some wings and just shoot the shit, talk about work and, and our, how our wives drive us crazy and how our, <laughs> our kids are brats um, <laughs> and, and just vent to each other and kind of unload in a healthy way so that we can come back and be, you know, un, unfrustrated, I guess. Um I, I do like to take vacations and, and go do things that make me uncomfortable. Cool. Um, I've always been the kind of person like, I know that I'm afraid of heights, mm -hmm. but I like that feeling. I like, you know, like when I was in my early twenties, I went skydiving twice when I was in the military, not because I had to, but because I knew it scared the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. And before I died, I wanted to, I want to know what that feels like. I want to mm -hmm. know what it's like to free fall and, you know, reach terminal velocity. And you're like, I chose to do this and here I am rushing towards the earth and my chute may not open. I don't know. Like, you know, things like that are like, I'm not a wilderness person, but I'll, I, I wanted to go rafting and go camping and be stuck outside without all the creature comforts that I'm used to. Cause I, I've never really lived that life. Mm -hmm. So we've done that with the kids several times, um, which to some people is no big deal, but for someone like me, it's huge. Cause the whole time, everything in me is trying to be uncomfortable and look for ways to get out of it. But you're forced. You're, it forces you to look around you and be grateful for what you have and just take a breath and let everything else go. And like, Hey, I'm here with my wife and kids and we're having fun mm -hmm. and appreciate those moments because, you know, once they turn 18 and they're out of the house, it's kind of over. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like to put myself in positions that like we went on a cruise a few years ago and, it was at like the height of my, uh, as I was gaining more and more commercial work. So I'm starting to get in with all these big companies and I'm like feeling like I hit, I'm in my prime and my wife's asking me to basically unplug for a week, mm -hmm. you know, and leave the U S where my cell phone's not going to work at all. Mm -hmm. And I got to leave all this success that I'm having for myself behind and have no access to any of it. And to some people that would sound great. But for some reason, I had a, I initially had a hard time with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I find myself at 41 years old not knowing how to unwind and take time. Yeah, I, I have a hard time making myself not think about my, my work or not think about toys and statues and comics and, and all that make-believe stuff and, and remember that there is a real life and it matters. Mm -hmm. And those, pe those people need you too, not just to earn a check but to be present. That's right. And I, I have a hard time being present. So now, um, now going back a little bit into the hobby too. And you, I think you touched some really important aspects there. Um, I can relate to that personally. Um, like I've been doing this, um, full time, like doing YouTube and the podcast for the last two years, I left a good job. I was tired of doing what I was doing. As soon as I turned 40, I was like, I'm done with, you know, the business world, I'm done dealing with customers, dealing with money. I just want to do my own thing. And I actually it was my wife's idea to say, why don't you go full time? You know, my daughter at that time, she was already out of the house. She's living with us again because of COVID-19. Things didn't work out for her with her husband and they have to move back here. So I have to move from my space to this space, which is, you know, I, I feel you. I understand uh -huh. how things happen. So I think COVID has been tremendous. It's really changed the way we do things uh, for all of us everywhere. And it really has to really push us to reinvent the wheel at the same time. So I'm doing yes. this, but uh, it's been hard because I, I, like last year, I got really, really sick. So I had to take time to go to Mexico with my, my parents. My mother says, come home. I will take care of you. So I went into a detox time, three months over there. 
like know anything and it was it was a bit scary at the beginning because i was so used to doing this like being in my computer creating videos for youtube like i can be here for like 16 hours and i've always even when i was working before this time um you know doing this in youtube i've always been a workaholic it's like i yeah put myself out in whatever I do. And even if I'm home, even if I'm on vacation, I'm always thinking about work. So it's been, it's challenging because I'm a passionate person. And I feel that uh, I have never met an artist that is not passionate. I do, I do think that whoever is an artist has passion and you are so a creator, you're constantly creating in your mind, even when you're not doing, even when you're just watching television or a movie in your mind, you're just thinking about how to improve your craft, how to do things better. Uh, you're just yep. thinking what to do next. And it's something that I'm always struggling. So what you're saying there, I can I can really relate on that because even on the time that, you know, I love to play video games. I love to watch movies. Well, even when I'm doing that, my mind is like, what I can do next? You know, what I can do on my podcast, what I can do on my videos. How can I improve this? How can I improve that? I'm not at the same level. I would say I'm not creating or sculpting or painting, but I'm creating content and that also requires some uh, part of me that is artistic. You know, it's a lot of things where I feel that uh, totally, I, I do think that a lot of people can relate with you, with what you're saying, not really, uh, you know, having the time. Not that you don't have the time. It's like, it's hard for you to really dedicate time just to completely forget about what you're doing. It's hard for me. It's always been uh, because I'm all in or I'm all out. You know, I, when I took this. Right. It was all in. It was that I said, you know, I want to create videos. I was creating videos like eight, nine years ago. That's when I started posting videos on YouTube. But one day I said, you know what? I want to do this full time. I really want to become a creator. I want to do the podcast. Now, let me ask you this, because I know that we've been talking about a lot of things. And uh, there's one thing that I really want to ask you, because right now, of course, as you know, the industry is changing. It's really changing yeah. really, really fast. There's so much good stuff out there. Of course, prices are crazy. But the art is the, the it's amazing, like never seen before. I never seen anything like this. What do you think about the this industry right now? What do you think about the state of it? You think it's healthy? Do you think uh, uh, it's gonna get better? Do you think it's gonna get worse? Do you think we're in the middle of a bubble because there's so much stuff out there? What do you think about it? Um, I'd have to say yes to everything you said. It's it's that's the thing. Um, depending on what level you're in like where where you where you exist um if, if if you're um in the business side and you're like higher up in a company that's your job is to make decisions um your job is to make approvals your job is to take care of the the hiring and the divvying out of work to the artists um you're in charge of uh of advertising and social media um you're one of the artists who creates the thing or you're one of the people who collects it. Uh, someone like yourself who promotes things, who guys who do reviews and give a, a like, okay, an out of the box mm -hmm. to, to give people a real idea of, okay, this is what you're really getting. This is a random piece off the production line. We all saw the, the prototype. Now let's, let's judge what we're all getting for our money mm -hmm. from the top to the bottom. It depends right now i think it's good for some because i think as things evolve and as things change you do have to reinvent the wheel you do and i had a conversation with with uh, randy bowen about this right after i got into printing you know just to let him know hey i'm i'm printing now so you know if you need anything give me a holler and that's what we we talked about he had actually mentioned that going back to the the traditional sculpting versus ebrush as we've come into the digital age and as technology has allowed us to improve on what we do uh, and make things faster and easier if an artist isn't willing to reinvent their own wheel mm -hmm. they get left behind um, and there's some sculptors who just weren't willing to make the change from digital or from traditional to digital and it affected them mm -hmm. and then there's 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 a couple who haven't had to uh, and there's a few who have done it and you can tell they still struggle and they're not happy. They would rather do it the old way. Um, but I think it's, you know, the industry is like, it's like, I mean, it's, it's a roller coaster. It's mm -hmm. what's great for me is bad for the next guy. It's, it's all about your own individual situation as well and how well you can adapt and, you know, make it work for you. I'll say that there are a lot of people doing this now where, 
Um, a lot of freelancers are feeling it. We don't have a lot of work. A lot of the companies have scaled back their their mm-hmm. product um, because of COVID, because people have lost jobs. Mm-hmm. They're not spending as much. Uh, but at the same time, every time you get uh, stimulus money, I've had I've noticed every time mm-hmm. you know people have got a check, I get an influx of messages. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's not uh, affecting it in as negative a way as I as I think some people want to believe. Mm-hmm. But as a freelancer. Uh, I went from six clients down to two. Mm. So now I've had to kind of up my game with the, in the private sector. And um, fortunately I, I've already had work that was put in place for that very reason. Mm-hmm. You know, as, as I mentioned, when you, when you take on the private work to supplement when commercial work is not coming in, that stuff starts to back up. So the beauty of it is that uh, more collectors in the last seven months have finally seen their stuff comes to fruition because I haven't had the interruptions of the commercial world. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I could say, well, I lost, you know, I lost all those clients. So that's bad, but I'm able to make good on my, my deals with collectors, which is good. Mm -hmm. And it gave me the time to learn how to 3d print. So now Mm -hmm. I'm able to provide another service and earn passive income by letting the printers kind of do their thing Mm -hmm. while while I go back to painting. So now I'm earning double. Um, But, you know, life gives you lemons. Make lemonade. Yeah. Yeah. So I I have a hard time answering. I know a lot of people want to talk about the state of the industry and I don't know that I'm really the one to ask because Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I'm not clicky and I'm not in those circles and I don't Mm -hmm. really look at it as the industry. I strictly look at it as the door, the pathway that that's open to me, mm-hmm. the, the relationship that I have with the industry. Mm-hmm. Ask me about that. Is that healthy? Where mm-hmm. do I see that going? Um, I think it's, it's been better. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's healthy enough that I'm not struggling. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've also, <laughs> I, I made good use of, of that downtime and that uh, the quarantine and the lockdown. I'm, I made good use of that and I invested in myself and taught myself how to 3d print. So I would say to other people, if you're in a situation where what's going on around you forces you to kind of like figure something out, don't sit around feeling bad for yourself and looking at, looking at the situation as oh things just got worse. I'm about to lose this, this, and this, you know, the snowball effect will set in look at at the opportunities that have opened up for you. You know, if you've lost the ability to work, to make money, you've gained time to maybe make money in a different way or market yourself in a different area. Um, You have to, you know, it's just like invest, investing money, investing in yourself is the same thing. You have to diversify, especially as an artist, you have to be able to do SpongeBob and avatar, the airbender and halo and Wolverine and a predator here and there and you know whatever else if you if you're a one trick pony and you're only good at one thing you're limited you're you're only going to get hired for that one thing and i used to be that i used to be the superhero guy for years i still kind of am but i do them really well not that i don't do frankenstein well but i'm not known for that so who who thinks of me when they think of frankenstein Mm -hmm. nobody nobody (laughs) but i would love to do that because i grew up on that stuff so you know um, yeah, it, it's kind of, I think the industry is kind of all over the place mm-hmm. and I think it's, it's whatever you want to make of it as a collector, you know, you may be able to find a new, a, a new platform to represent this hobby that someone hasn't really thought of, or just do it, just, it, you know, take the time and innovate. Yeah. That's what, that's what we do as, as humans. So yeah, I'd, I'd say that I don't, it's definitely not going anywhere. I, I think that if anything with the, the combination of the, the, the ZBrush artist and the, the fact that printers are becoming more affordable, you're going to stop buying model kits and you're going to start buying STLs and finding someone who can either print for you or you'll print it yourself. Mm-hmm. You may still need to hire someone who can finish the model out physically and put a good paint job on it. But we're getting closer to the, the age where you're going to be able to make your own toys and statues at home. That's right. You're not going to have to buy them from, Diamond Select or Mezco or or Sideshow or Prime One or NECA. I mean, their stuff may still be kind of better, 
Mm -hmm. Um, but if you want to invest your time into, to gaining that knowledge, all you have to do is buy the materials and start. Cool. So, you know, yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question. My, no, my brain so. is kind of all over the place because that's, that's a really huge, uh, area to try to cover, especially for someone where you got to think I freelance from Ohio. Mm. So my connection to the industry isn't the same as someone who paints in house for gentle giant or sideshow or, or, you know, there's a lot of in-house guys, sculptors and painters where their opinion, their, their answer to that question, I guarantee will be different. Correct. Cause it affects them differently. That's right. Cause yep. they're a salaried employee and I'm not. So. Mm-hmm. Now let me ask you this, uh, you know, before we, we go to, I want to ask you this. Um, I know probably a lot of people are listening now or, I don't know if they're going to listen in the future, but I know if someone is interested um, that it wants to be a painter and wants to work for this company, perhaps it's just starting uh, doing stuff here and there, but they want to have uh, any type of advice. They need a, you know advice. What, what, what can you give them? Um, what is it would be your advice to them now that they're starting and they want to get more involved into the industry? Um, man. I could try to give a lot of advice, but I mean, um, a lot of it's not really important because like I said, your, your journey is going to be different than mine. Mm -hmm. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that I'll, I'll be able to, um, relate to, but the the specifics will be different. I'd say, I guess the first thing that I would, I would want to advise someone on is be careful who you share your dream with. Be, be careful mm-hmm. who you let in when you say, Hey, I'm really passionate. I want to do this. I'm trying to learn this. There's a lot of people who are going to possibly hurt your feelings, mm-hmm. especially your friends and family, because they're going to see it as a, you're going to fail and they don't want to see you fail and get hurt. Mm-hmm. So they're not encouraging you the way you need to be encouraged mm-hmm. right off the bat. Um, if you want critiques and you want advice on your work, stop showing it to other collectors. A lot of, I mean, no offense, but a lot of them, how much of an eye do they really have for our, are, do you, do they know what they're talking about? Mm-hmm. You're asking for someone who has no education in art, no artistic ability mm-hmm. to critique your, your artistic ability mm-hmm. and art is art's very subjective. So don't look for critiques from the average person. Go to other artists who know what they're looking at and who can do what you're doing. And ask them to critique your art because they're going to cut out the bullshit and stick to the technique or the application or the thought. Um, they're going to point out specific things in the work that you need to work on because mm-hmm. they're going to see it and they're going to recognize, ah, I see what you did. You could have done more. You could have pushed it further. Or have you used this product or are you applying it this way or blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to get the technical advice that you need from a person who is technically able. So, um, like for me, it was, you know, guys like Rick Cantu and, and Dan Cope, Dan Cope was awesome. You know, I took a piece to a show and I showed it to him in person and said, here, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be like you. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And he told me honestly what he thought and it felt good, but it wasn't all, you know, um, yeah. And, and it helped. It made me realize it. It put it into a real frame for me to say, okay, am I wasting my time? Do I just not have it? Am I close or, you know, whatever. Um, So yeah, show your work around the community to people who are other sculptors and painters and and have them give you their critiques on your work. They'll, they'll be way more graceful about it. First of all, they're not going to smash your feelings. Um, And they'll also give you things that you can actually build on and can Mm. use in, you know, and use in your work. Um, Anything else is just opinion. That's right. And doesn't doesn't matter. You'll you'll fall right into that hole I was talking about earlier about you know when you and I were talking before the podcast started about self doubt mm-hmm. um, and how you just kind of want to throw it all down and quit. Um, you know, um, I would also say don't be don't be too quick to monetize what you're trying to do and say I want to I want to you know get paid to do a couple paint jobs. Everybody does. It sounds great. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is if you're not able to give the client what they're asking for, you may end up in a panic because you suddenly feel like you just put yourself in a, a hole you can't get out of, mm-hmm. whether it's a collector or 
uh, a company, and especially with a company, if you don't feel like you're, and I don't mean ready emotionally, like in a mature way. Um, I mean, if your paint jobs just don't hold up to other guys' work or girls, um, don't go to a company asking for work thinking that you're going to like build up through that channel. All you're going to do is have them get angry with you and never hire you again. Um, Cause you're going to turn in something that they're going to be like, you know, what is this? Mm -hmm. This guy's not, you know, and then they should, they should hopefully do their homework on you before they hire you. But I've, I've seen a couple of guys that are too quick to jump in, you know, professionally. And then they just, they get their heart broken and they, they get kind of spit back out. And then it's all of a sudden they're like, Oh, it's not what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would, I think most people would rather wait a year or two and get better and have a good experience going in than to go in too soon and just have the whole thing be a train wreck. That's right. Cause they'd really, don't, you don't get a lot of second chances in the industry mm -mm. You know, in the hobby. Sure. You can get second chances in the hobby. I've seen a lot of guys get chances. You know, you sometimes projects get away from you. Sometimes you over promise and under deliver. <laughs> um, and not every, and another thing is, um, not every, not every piece can be your best piece. Mm -hmm. So you could do, you know, any painter out there who's trying to do this, you can do a really awesome Hulk and then start in on an Iron Man or a Wonder Woman and struggle through it and get done with it. And it's just not, you know, it looks like two different, the, between the Hulk and the one you just did, looks like two different people. Mm -hmm. Um, the nature of this stuff is that you, you know, you're not a machine. You're not a photocopier. You're not uh, able to just duplicate all the time. So every third or fourth piece may be just kind of so-so mm -hmm. or maybe really kind of just rough. And people need to understand that you're still trying, you're still doing your best, but results may vary. And it could be um, what you have going on in your personal life. You're having a creative block. It could be that your airbrush isn't, acting how you want it to or you're trying new paints that just aren't responding well because you don't have the experience with them mm -hmm. um you know experience plays a big part in this um you know I, but at the same time I, I don't want anyone to get disheartened and think that if they're not getting the kind of results that you know that lewis got where he you know and just it, it seemed like overnight he went from like starting out and his stuff was you know really rough and it's like you, you could see it but it was still like eh, i don't know and then all of a sudden one day it's like whoa wait like you mm -hmm. know he's doing he's doing repairs and doing customs and like you know fixing stuff that just looked totally smashed um or turning one character into another and it's like no that looks right it looks like it came that way mm -hmm. um you yeah it'll take it takes time like don't everybody wants it to happen now Everybody wants the pat on the back and the, the, like, who doesn't love posting their stuff on one of the stature groups and getting 25 people to tell you, man, that looks awesome. That's mm -hmm. a great feeling. I'll admit that. Um, but, you know, you got to just let it happen. Let it, like, don't go fishing for compliments and looking for praise if you haven't really earned it yet. Like, it'll come when it's time to come. Mm -hmm. And until then, just, you know, keep your head down and, and focus on being better. Look at what other guys are doing. Don't try to be like them, but look at your work and look at theirs and say, is, is mine, you know, am, am I close? Or are, are we doing, you know, similar work? And if your flesh tones look off or if your, your costumes are a little too, like, you know, sometimes stuff looks a little too clean. Like a lot of, I've seen some really bad weathering. Mm -hmm. And I would say, do more Google searches. Look at things that are weathered in real life look at the breakup and the patterns that happen naturally. Um, don't use a stencil or don't use something where it's going to look repetitive or uniform, you know, things like that. Look to, look to real life um, and look to nature for your inspiration for all of your paint jobs because everyone's eyes have been seeing how things are supposed to look their entire life. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're trying to replicate that on a piece of plastic. That's right. And that's not something you can just pick up in a day or two. Mm -hmm. so I guess it's just be patient with yourself is my, my biggest piece of advice. Be patient with yourself, have faith in yourself, give it time, but also realize at some point whether or not you're wasting your time.
That's right. Because if everybody could do this, everybody would be doing it. Mm -hmm. But it's not for everybody. That's right. Well, Ed, I want to say um, I do appreciate the conversation. Um, this podcast has been very enlightening, at least for me. Hey, not for anyone else. I, I don't it's know. I, that's going in. I was even like, I hope that this, this is going to work out. <laughs> that it's at least entertaining, if nothing else. Like, I don't know that anything that I have to say is relevant or really matters. Oh, but it I is. Defi I definitely have opinions. I always have. I always will. I'm a very opinionated person, and I'm not really shy about saying how I feel about things well i'm but grateful it, 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 yeah it doesn't mean that i think i'm right or that my opinion is above all um you know th this is just for entertainment purposes yeah and you know hopefully uh everybody liked it and i had a good time so yeah thank you for for having me on it's you know i feel uh you know I, i'm not one to really say blessed a lot mm -hmm. but yeah it's, it's always a blessing when someone you know values uh your thought process and your your experiences and wants to kind of um document that in one way or another and share it with with people who may be interested so if nothing else it may it'll probably get the community talk, talking a little bit did you see that did you hear that shit ed said i can't believe he said that. But, uh, <laughs> now is there a place uh, i don't know do um do you have a website or a place where people can go just to see your portfolio or any or only just your facebook page yeah, I have a website. I haven't updated it recently. It really needs an update. Um, and I've been meaning to reach out to someone who, you know, does web design and mm -hmm. say, hey, maybe, maybe we do a trade. I'll, I'll repair a statue or I'll repaint something for you. and You can do my website. But I do have a website. Um, it's www.bradleyspaintstudio.weebly.com. -E and then I'm also on Instagram as uh at hey painter guy okay so you can see uh i've tried to update my instagram more with daily processes okay in progress but with the commercial stuff i can't show any of that mm -hmm. so the only thing i can really show is private commissions but like i said i've been doing more of those lately so i've been able to to share as often as some of the other painters can share yeah i will have a, in the description we will have all the information about your website your instagram also facebook you're on facebook correct you know that's where we yeah. you know mm -hmm. so if people want to reach out um uh, companies or individuals want to reach out uh they want yeah. a, some private commission or any type of work or anything um that i think it, it's a it's a great guy and uh, i do recommend him he's a fantastic person to deal with and as you can see right here you can hear in this conversation he has a lot to share and he has a lot of experience uh but i want to say to all that have listened to up to this point or have watched this video in youtube or listened to the different platforms i want to say thank you for the time thank you for the opportunity to 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 listen and to for us you know to be here with us and to share this moment i think it was enriching for me i really enjoy the conversation but i want to say to all of you uh don't forget if you're watching on youtube to like to uh leave a comment to subscribe to the channel uh also follow on social media facebook twitter instagram the links are in the description and also consider supporting this channel financially you can do that uh to patreon uh the link is, again is in the description but my friends i want to say thank you again Te uh, ed uh, i want to about to say ted but ed i want to say thank <laughs> you man thank you very much i do appreciate the conversation hopefully we can repeat this um talk about other things not necessarily um you know, we can talk about movies or we can talk about anything else. There's so much we can do in this podcast. Yeah, I would, I would love to talk about other, you know, other pop culture related things or, or, or whatever. I mean, you know, being, being isolated so much and, you know, working by myself a lot. Um, and then when I'm not doing that, I'm with my kids. So, you know, the, the interaction and the ability to talk to other adult males about non-statue related things. Yeah. It's we, few and far between. So I know, I know. I feel the same <laughs> way, particularly now with COVID yeah. and everything. We just enclose here and you know, I have a lot of passions. You can see I love comics, I love gaming, yeah. I love movies. You know, we are part of the same generation. So I grew up with the same cartoons you grew up. I grew up with the same type of anime. So to me I I, I love a lot of things. So that's the reason I created the podcast. So we can yeah. share uh I can share all those aspects of my life. I can talk about those things that really matter. So uh, to me, more, most importantly to me, uh, I think a lot of people feel the same way. But I want to say to all that have watched this and are you know and have listened to this, thank you for your time, and we'll talk to you again. Bye bye.